A promise is a pledge to provide a service. I'm not promising you'll be entertained. I'm not promising we're the best show in town. What I am promising is to teach you biblical truth with practical application. I promise to teach men to fight for their faith, their families, and their futures through the word of God. I'm Douglas Gumby, lead pastor of the Contenders Church. Join us in the fight at contenderschurch.org. In the book of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, it simply says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes father i bless you god i simply thank you for allowing us to trust you for giving us the moments the things the ideas the time and the energy to trust you god as we're in this place allow this to be a bettering of who we are Take us not only in our hearts and what we believe, take us not only in our minds and what we think, but take us now in our lives and how we live and allow us to live the life that you have called us to live. Father, we honor you for these moments. Move Duck Gumby out of the way. Allow these words that I speak be the words that you desire for me to say, even if it changes from what's on this, this path. God, I thank you for you being glorified today in the lives of your people. It is in Jesus' name I simply pray. Amen and amen. I want, I want to start this off by saying this. Listen, we worry too much. That's a fact. We, 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 we have so much going on in our lives. Uh, men, we tend not to worry as much as women, but it does not mean you don't worry. Uh, you, you, we, we have so many things that are sitting on our plate. We have our children. We have our homes. We have our lives, our lifestyle, our livelihood. We have so many things in play that cause us to worry. But like I said this morning in the prayer, that's not our job. It's not our job to walk around here wringing our hands with an old woe is meat attitude. It is our job to trust God that no matter what we see, doesn't mean you don't plan, doesn't mean you don't lay aside, doesn't mean you don't pay attention to what's going on. It just simply means that no matter what you face, no matter what you plan, no matter what you put to the side, you have to trust God with it all in, in knowing that he's going to take care of everything for you. Christianity, uh, for the record, is a culmination of our ability to believe in the sovereign of a, a sovereignty of a risen Savior who gave us the gift of redemption. I believe that Christ's sacrifice on the cross satisfied our greatest need so much that our earthly needs uh, carry less weight than originally intended. I, I, I realize and I know this, man has three basic needs. You want to have somewhere to sleep, you want to have something to eat, and you want to you have a, a, a food, clothes, and shelter. You want to be dressed nice, okay? And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem is, is when we make that a priority over trusting God. The problem is when we put our need over our need for him. That'll catch on in a few seconds. I'll keep talking. But the, the, when we take notice of the lack of food, clothes, and shelter, then we get to this place of God, how is this going to happen? Okay, case in point, have you ever lived a life in, at any point in your life where the, the, the money you had didn't match the need you needed it for? That should be everybody in the room. At some point, your money does not match what you have to have. But at the end of the day, whether you realize it or not, whether you paid attention to it or not, when you look back at that, just look back at that situation, somehow, some way, God provided that's a fact. I've been short. I've been in a place where nobody knew except for me and my wife. And all of a sudden, God laid it on somebody's heart to bless us, to help us take care of what they didn't even know we needed. No communication that I had with a person. No, no, no letters that I wrote. Oh, God, I need help. Somebody please meet my... No. God took care of the need that I didn't even know how I was going to supply. That's how sovereign he is. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're dealing with. And here's the key. He knows how you're going to deal with it. So, in essence, it behooves us to trust God with everything. 
We take notice of these things, food, clothes, shelter, when the resources seem to come up short. But these things are never an issue for God. The issue is and always be, will be with us, with man. We will always have the issue. The issue will always, be, will always manifest in our doubt, in our thinking, in our belief. The issue will always cause us to worry. It's an innate ability, just like believing, doubting is there as well. You have, to, you have to tell yourself, I believe. I don't see it. I don't know how I'm going to get to it, but I believe. I stopped by this morning. I put on my suit, as hot as I am, and I came in this room to let you know that he, the, the truth of the matter is, you can prevail over your own issues. You can overcome whatever your issues are. Remember I said the issue is and will be with you. You can overcome that. You can overcome your own sense of doubt and disbelief. And I came here to tell you, you can win over worrying. For the time that is ours to share, I want to speak from a simple topic, winning over worry winning over worry. Three things I want to share with you in order to understand how to win over worry. I want you to understand this. Number one, you must comply with the command. There's a command that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. He simply says this, therefore I tell you do not worry about your life. Stop right there. You're still worried about the bill. You st you st you're worried about the small things in the big picture. Jesus said, don't worry about the bills. Don't worry about how you're going to pay the bills. Don't worry about who owes you. Don't worry about who talk about you. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. He asked this question, and I ask it of you. Is not life more than food? Is not life more? more is not the body more than the clothes you put on he's asking us things that we tend not to pay attention to because some kind of way we have a divided system in our lives hey i'm a christian i love the lord i believe but i've been taught by this standard that i have to have a b and c in order to be proven to be successful but the bible says that with god all things are possible but the world says that I've got to have a nice house, a nice job, a nice this and a nice that to prove to them, to them that I have arrived. But God said, if you trust me, you already have, a I have gotten there, but I'll take you somewhere you never expected to go. But in order to do that, you've got to comply with the command. And, it, and, and the question I ask is, who's given the command in your life? Who's giving the orders in your life? When you step back now that I'm making this visible to you, when you step back and look at your life, are you living the life that your neighbor or your coworker or your family want you to have? Or have you found your peace with God that whether you have or don't have, whether you fit with the have or the has nots, do you have peace? with God. Help me, Holy Ghost. Worry is the distraction of time and energy. Worry is the distraction of time and energy. Worry means to give way to anxiety or unease, to allow one's mind to, to, mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. This is what happens when we worry. Worry causes one to be torn at the seam of their mind. I can do it, but what if? I'm going to try it, but what if? Worry, it, it takes away the, 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 the power of the confidence that God gives to you naturally. When you, when you trust God, but you doubt the action that he tells you to take, you, it causes you to worry, and it causes you to fall off. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26, Jesus gives us some examples throughout Matthew chapter 6. 
He says in verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? The birds of the air, they don't work. They don't plant seed, yet God takes care of them. They just go about their day, flying and being free. And when they're thirsty, they land, they get something to drink. When, they, when they're hungry, somebody will see them. They may be at a park, and all of a sudden, somebody say, oh, look, let's go feed them. And they eat, and they don't even, they don't even have concern as to how they're going to eat. They trust God so much so that their trust is their life. You and I, we are made in the akon, the Greek for image and likeness of God, the akon of God. The question that has to be asked, if God takes care of the birds that are not created in his image, how much more is he going to take care of you? Stop. Don't look at the problems of tomorrow. Look at the solutions of yesterday. Look at what God has already done for you and answer the question for yourself. He's already done everything. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 27. Jesus pokes a little fun. He says this, which, of, which one of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Who by worrying can grow taller? Here's the thing. God knew when he put you in your mother's womb how tall you were going to be, how much hair or none hair you were going to have, and worrying ain't going to change none of that. I'm mad at Lamar and, and, and Rodney this morning because they grow beards and I can't. And I told them that. And I asked them, I, I leaned over the, the, the booth, I said, I said, brothers, I need, I need both of y'all to help me because here it is, I'm joking, but in, in reality, it bothers me. I want facial hair. I'm tired of looking like a grown baby. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. I'm sensitive. Don't laugh. I'm sensitive. Where my last two dollars at? Um, so here we are. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm being genuine because I'm jokingly saying, hey, I see both of y'all got something that I want, but here's the thing. Does God want me to have that? And the problem with us is, we can't trust God because we're so busy going after what everybody else has because it worked for them. But because it worked for them don't mean it's supposed to work for you. And you got to find your niche. You got to find your, your wherever you're supposed to be. That means you got to pull back from what you want, what you desire, and you got to trust him with everything. I came to preach this morning. I told y'all I feel good. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and is tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, ye of little faith, you have to comply with the command. Here's the thing. Whether your clothes fit or don't fit, they're yours. That means God provides. Listen, and when it's time for you to get new, I am a witness that whether the resources are there or not, God will provide. But the key for you and I is we cannot worry. You can't worry about what you have no control over. You want to win over worry? Comply with the command. What is the command? Don't worry. It's that simple. Don't worry about your life. Well, you don't know what I got to deal with. Who cares what you got to deal with? God knows what you got to deal with. 
It's not what I know about you. It's not what I know what you got to deal with. It's not what I know about how much you're going through. Who cares? No matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going through, God said, trust him, period. Don't worry. I know that's arrogant, but it's true. Not only must you comply with the command, but you must also practice patience. Practice patience. We know that the trying of your faith activates your patience. That's not the scripture, but I just threw that in there for you. Matthew 6 and 31 through 33 simply says this. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after these things, the Gentiles seek. And your heavenly father knows you have need of these things. But, Seek first, but changed everything. Do not worry about what you're going to eat. Do not worry about where you're going to live. Do not worry about how you're going to survive. Do not worry about these things, but seek first. See, we, we've been so busy in church telling people how to become earthly rich that they're spiritually poor. We become so satisfied with the, the prosperity of the gospel that we fail to realize that it's the gospel that makes us rich and it has nothing to do with our bank accounts. The first command was, the command is do not worry. We are to practice what not to worry about. And that's the hardest part of the job. You can say, no, I ain't worried about it. But then your habits make you go back in to what you've always done. And you find yourself, whether you thinking about it or not, I wonder what I'm going to eat tomorrow. It's 13 cents in the account. And I just prayed and asked God for the credit to go through for gas. I don't know what I'm going to eat tomorrow. Peanut butter and jelly are both dried up. There is no bread. I have no clue. Jesus said, I got you. I'm, I'm putting it in today's terms so you get it. I, I, he knew the bread was going to be molded. He knew you couldn't even get the knife in the corner to get that old stale peanut butter. He knew the jelly was, mm-mm, mm-mm. Just throw it in the trash. And guess what he said? I'm still going to provide a better meal than you could prepare for yourself. But you have to trust me. Have, have, you, ever, have, have you ever been in this situation? Where, and I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just, this not nothing personal. Have you ever been in a situation where your money did dry up, you didn't have nothing to eat, and all of a sudden your phone rang and somebody said, come by and get something to eat? We own the grill. Uh, Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, that was God taking care of you. And they had enough food that not only did you go over there and eat, but for the time that you needed to have extra food, they said, wrap some up, put some in some, put some, in some aluminum foil. You, come on, because you, you know, half of y'all know y'all sneak aluminum foil in your pocket. Don't act like you ain't never done it. Don't act like you ain't never showed up at somebody's family reunion and you ain't no nobody. All you had was these last two dollars. One was for the bus fare and the other for the jukebox to sing the blues. Come on, back home. <laughs> In Matthew 6 and 25 through 30, Jesus gives us examples of how much God takes care of the things in nature. He gives us example of how much God takes care of the things in nature and the things in nature don't worry about how they're going to be taken care of. And if the things in nature can get the concept that God takes care of you enough, then why can't we? Here's an example. Great thought. A homeless man on the street. You see a homeless man reaching into a garbage can. Most people would say, why is he isn't in that situation? Well, he must have put himself there. That's not the issue. The issue is 
he's hungry enough to bend over and reach in the garbage can. When he reaches in the garbage can, he finds a half-eaten, cold, molded sandwich. This is what it does. Homeless people sometimes have more sense than Christians. He finds a place to sit with that half-eaten, cold, molded sandwich. He puts it in his lap. He puts his hands together, and he thanks God. And before he takes a bite, somebody sees him put his hands together and thank God. And they say, listen, if he got enough sense to do that over a half-eaten, cold, semi-molded sandwich, let me provide for him. This happens all the time. It has happened for you all the time. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I have to practice patience because we are the Burger King generation. We want it our way. And, and here's the thing. I can't tell God and you can't tell God what to do with your life. <laughs> At the end of the day, I'm not in control and nor, neither are you. We have to trust him with everything. Philippians uh, chapter 4 and verse 12. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12 and verse 13. He's, Paul says this to the Philippians. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed. I am complying with the command to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. Then Paul says this, I can do all things. See, that's a level of trust that I want to get us to. Not that it, you give me the credit for doing it because I get none. But I want to teach us so much to trust in God that when everything fails and falls apart, you live life like nothing's wrong. That doesn't mean nothing's wrong. It just means that you don't trust in the stuff that went wrong more than you trust in the God who is going to make it all right. You can do all things through Christ, including winning over worry when you practice patience. You can win over worry. You got to comply with the command. That's, that's, the, that's the easy part of it. The hard part, you got to practice patience. And, and lastly... In order to win over worry, I need you to know something. Help is coming. Help is coming. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. Jesus said this, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Each day will bring with it its own trouble. Now, we have received the command and we have received the way to deal with the solution. We must, we, we, we must not worry and we must practice patience. Remember, the command is, done, is not to worry. The practice is what not to worry about. Should, should, uh, they should never go beyond or extend beyond the grace we've been extended for the day. We've got to, we've got to not worry about tomorrow because we haven't finished with today. Here's the key. We must not be baffled about mentally planned events that are subject to change when they come to fruition. Okay, I'll make that make sense. That was the big version. That was the try to me trying to be smart version. Here's the simple version for me. I don't have no control over the stuff I plan in my mind that I didn't plan out well enough to make happen. Okay. I got $100. In my mind, I done spent that $100 92 different ways. I got $100, and I plan. And here's the thing. My plan versus God's plan is always different. I got $100. I done spent it now 97 ways. But no matter how many times I try to spend it, I can't because God has a different plan for that $100 for me. 
And every time I try, hey, oh man, that, you know what? That's a good idea. I'm finna go. Do, my heart, yeah. I got a phone call. I got a. I, I can't. I can't do what I want to do when I want God to do what He needs to do. I'll say that again. I can't do what I want to do when I want God to do what He needs to do. And so the prayer that we must begin to pray is no longer God, uh, give me strength. I can do all things. The prayer that we pray is, God, your will be done. What do you want me to do? What is your plan for my life? How am I supposed to trust you today? Every day brings along with it its own burden and cares and, and grievances. Every day brings along with it its own supply of strength for you as well. Thinking about the cares of tomorrow, Jesus said, is unnecessary. Worrying about what's not in front of you to handle is a waste of of time and energy. Remember, worry is a distraction of time and energy. Worry means to give away to anxiety or unease, to allow one's mind to dwell on difficulty or trouble. Worry causes one's mind to be torn at the seam. 97 different things I could do with the $100, but God has one that will supply my need for the day. How can you win over worry? Lamentations, you don't have to turn to it because I know half of us don't even know what Lamentations is. Chapter 3 and verse 22. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassion fails us not. Here it is. We are trying to win over worry but we can't win over worry because we worry ourselves trying not to worry when God simply says, trust him. I can't say that again, so you have to listen to that one later. I'm, I'm sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> How can we win over worry? Jesus gives us the answer, John chapter 14. You can turn that. John chapter 14, verse 15 through 18. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and shall be with you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave your mind divided. I will come to you. Today is a special day known as Pentecost. Pentecost, the Greek name is Shabbat, the Feast of Weeks or the celebration of giving the law to Moses at Sinai. Pentecost was also the occasion of the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and other disciples described in the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus said, I'm going to send you a comforter. The truth of the matter is, you cannot win over worry by yourself. The truth of the matter is, no matter how many resolutions you come up with, you will fail every last one of them as long as you operate in your own power. But Jesus said, I recognize because I designed you that you cannot operate in your own power. You need a different power source that's going to change your thinking even when you want to think the way you've always thought. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 through 8, when they were therefore come together, they asked the Lord saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore the gain the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power. Remember I just said you need to switch sources. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Decatur, in Atlanta, in Fulton, in Newton, in Stockbridge, in Gwinnett. You're going to be witnesses because here's the key. 
You changed power sources. Up until now, you've done everything under your own power. Up until now, you've done everything according to your own plans. Up until now, but you need the Holy Spirit to come in your life. You need him to transform not only your habits and your ways, but your thoughts and your thinking so that when worry presents itself again, you'll know how to handle it. The problems that worry causes are these. The problem is you are trying to do everything your way. Burger King generation. The problem with worry is that you are trying to do everything by yourself. All my ladies who independent throw yo. You got information for bay, but you won't line up for God. The problem with worry and what it causes that you are trying to do everything in your own time. This is where we fail, but help is on the way. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat on each of them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to focus on verse 4 of Acts. In, in Acts chapter, in, in, in the book of Acts, uh, in verse 4, it says this, And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, in the church world, We've taken tongues out of context. I preached on this before, so this ain't new and you won't be shocked unless you've never heard this before. But we've taken tongues to mean or real bad stuttering condition. I had to bring you back. Come on back. So we've, we've gone with tongues down this avenue when in context, the tongues that they spoke in were languages of different people to help them understand the gospel that Christ died for them and now the Holy Ghost, that comforter that he promised is now with them and can be with you. So in context, the apostles and disciples begin to proclaim the good news of the work of Christ on the cross. But in concept, I want to, I, I get the context. I, I, I want to stay and I'm true to the context. But in concept, the apostles and disciples begin to speak and proclaim without worry or concern for their own future estate. You do remember Christ was killed because he was proclaimed the king of the Jews. You do remember, you do recall that the disciples were in hiding for fear of their own lives. But when the Holy Ghost came over them, they didn't fear about their own future. They took to heart the words of Jesus, take no thought for tomorrow, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, how you're going to live. Your life is now in my hands. But Jesus promised them, I'm going to send you a comforter who will help you deal with this change that I'm going to take you through. And when the Holy Ghost comes in your life, you ain't got to fall out on the floor. You ain't got to turn over looking like you psychotic. You ain't got to sweat and foam at the mouth. When the Holy Ghost takes control of your life, he causes you to sit back and wait on him. And when your, when your human nature comes in and says, oh, I got, mm -mm. he says, be still. I got you. And the problem with us is that we struggle between belief and relief. The problem with us is that we want relief, but we don't know how to believe 
But if I can get you to believe, your relief comes with your belief. The Holy Spirit is a paraclete. I didn't say a pair of cleats, not football. He's a helper. He's an advocate. He's there for you. And the way you and I are going to win over worry is by yielding our lives, not just on Sunday, not on Saturday evening after you've done, done all you can, but every day. Every day, I'm going to trust God. When you go back tomorrow and you get to your job and they start worrying you, they start running you crazy, you start saying to yourself on the inside, because you will, ooh, if I didn't need this job, I cussed all y'all all the way out. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. If, if I didn't need this, I would go off on every last one of y'all from the top to the bottom. But ladies and gentlemen, that's an example of worry. That's an example of you trying to take control. That's an example of you being in charge. That's an example of you managing your time instead of trusting God that he put you in that place to strengthen you so you don't have to worry. And while you're there, he's providing for you. You can win over worry if you let the Holy Ghost in to lead you in stuff you already failing at doing. I've been challenged by the word. Father, I bless you. <laughs> God, you're an amazing God. God, I thank you that no person, no thing, no choice that we make gives us peace like you do. God, as I'm standing in this place, I'm thankful and I'm happy and I'm at peace because I trust you. My prayer is like my, the statement that I make often is that I, I study because I'm selfish, but I teach because I want people to know more than me. God, I, I have this peace and it's a selfish peace. But I talked about it today because I want people to develop that peace and have a greater peace with you than I do at this moment. That does not mean, God, that we don't have issues. That does not mean that we don't face issues and, and concerns. But it does mean that we trust you with our issues. We trust you with our concerns. God, let your Holy Spirit now take up residence and control in our lives. Thank you for sending him on this day years and years ago. But thank you that he's still with us after all of this time has passed, after all of these people have gone awry. God, you, he's still with us, comforting us and advocating for us. And God, we simply thank you for that. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.